וואו. And amen. Amen? Amen. I was watching Margaret as she was holding her baby. I thought, how precious that is. See a beginning, new life there. Justin talked about some struggles that he had faced in his life, and I'm sure many of us could share some struggles as well. This morning during Sunday school, I received a text from Dale and Shannon Sawatsky, from Dale, and he requested that we would pray for them, for their family, for Dale's dad, John. John was uh, placed into palliative care on Friday due to liver failure, and it is likely, according to the doctors, uh, one to two weeks. And so Dale has asked that I would share that with you, congregation, that we would pray for them, pray that uh, as they journey through these seemingly last days, that God would continue to bring his peace and his comfort over John, but also uh, for peace for the family, as they journey this road of grief, uh, grief with the process and all of that, that they would experience God's nearness. And so I want to, just before we uh, get into the message, I want to pause and to pray for them. Our Heavenly Father, we do bring before you uh, John. And Father, I thank you for a life of faith that he has lived. He's lived faithfully to proclaim your name to be, uh, to be your salt and light wherever he has gone. To be able to share the love of Jesus with those that he meets. Father, I thank you for the peace that he has because of his relationship with you. Father, we pray that you would continue to give him that peace and that, that comfort in these days. Father, I pray that the family, Dale and Shannon and their kids and the extended family, would also experience your nearness that they would experience your strength and your comfort, the courage that you would bring them and give to them during these days as well. Father, we have sung this morning that you are holy, that you are holy forever, that Jesus, your name is above all. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All the thrones, all the dominions, all the powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And Father, in the previous song that we sung, we sang these words that there will be a day where death will be no more. And we long for that day, Lord Jesus. Until then, may you be glorified in and through our lives. Father, this morning, as we dive into your word, I pray that my words would disappear, but that your words would stay fresh upon our hearts and our minds this morning. We just sense your spirit is moving powerfully here this morning. So, Father, I pray that I would not get in the way of that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Whew. I want to just continue singing. Let's do that a little bit more in a few minutes. Well, actually more than a few. Okay. If uh, you're new here or you haven't been around for a little while, uh, this fall, uh, in September here, we've uh, kicked off this year talking about uh, the theme of discipleship. Uh, perhaps as you maybe walked through these uh, doors, you saw that big word up you know, on, on the wall there that said, multiply. Uh, disciples who make disciples. That is what we're called to do. We are called as disciples of Jesus Christ to multiply and go and make more disciples. Uh, a call to discipleship is a call to being a disciple maker. That's for all of us. Uh, Jesus was about 30 years of age when he began his ministry years. Uh, Luke chapter 3 tells us that. And so as he was calling his disciples, his first disciples, he said to them, as recorded in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he said, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish 
for people. We'll send you out to fish for people. Discipleship is a call to come close to Jesus, not to just see him in action, but to be changed by him, to be committed to leading others to follow Jesus as well. And so in the series that we are in, we're looking at the Gospel of Luke, specifically in chapter 5. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do, but would you turn there in your scriptures, Luke chapter 5. What we see in this chapter are some fishing expeditions, if you will. Uh, we watch and we see how the disciples were joining in Jesus, and Jesus was taking him or taking them on these disciple or on these fishing expeditions where they would participate with him and they would learn from him as they went along. Uh, this was an exciting time for these first disciples. Uh, the popularity of Jesus was growing. There was crowds of people that were following Jesus. There was so much activity going on. And these first disciples were able to watch Jesus as he was curing people of their diseases, as he was performing all of these miracles, as he was teaching on the hillsides and so on and so forth. And they were watching as Jesus was calling the crowds to come follow me. Come and see, come and follow me. And so these first disciples, they were watching and learning from Jesus as Jesus was setting people free from the bondage of sin, that Jesus was not only granting physical healing to people that he came in contact with, but more importantly, he was healing them and giving them spiritual healing. That he was cleansing people from their diseases, but not just cleansing from their diseases, he was also cleansing them and forgiving them of the sin in their life. It was an exciting time. Last week, Jason spoke about two fishing expeditions. The first one was about Jesus healing a man with leprosy, and the second one that we saw last week was when Jesus healed the man who was paralyzed, who was lowered through the roof by his friends. Today, we're going to look at the third one. And I've labeled this one the one where Jesus parties with the tax collectors. Every time I get up to preach, I always feel like this passage is my new favorite passage in the Scripture. And probably that's true because for you this morning, you'll get about half an hour. But all week, I've spent about 20 hours in this passage. And I feel like I'm intimately connected with what's going on in this passage. And it's exciting for me, and it's exciting about the things that I've learned this week. And so if you have your Bibles open, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 27, we read these words. After this, okay, that was after what, Jesus, or what Jason talked about last week, the, Jesus healing the man with leprosy, Jesus healing the paralyzed man. After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Levi got up and he left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That statement right there is one of the most clarifying, most defining statements that Jesus has ever made. The purpose for why he exists, the reason why he came. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but I've called sinners to repentance. I like how the New Living Translation reads, and it says this, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. You see, understanding that statement is the key to understanding the essential uniqueness of the Christian faith. The reason why Christianity is different than any other religion out there. Because in that sentence, Jesus tells us why there was the incarnation, why he came in the flesh, why he was born of a virgin, why he lived, why he died, 
why he rose, why he ascended, why he now intercedes for us. The whole plan of salvation is summed up in that statement. He came to call sinners to repentance and to save those who would repent. You will see that written time and time again through the gospel of Luke. And what that means is that the Christian faith is not for people who think they're good and righteous on their own. The church is not for those who think that they are righteous in and of themselves. It is for people who know that they are not. That's why we're here. Because of Jesus Christ. It's not because of our own righteous acts. It is because of Jesus Christ. This right here is not a club for the righteous, but rather for those who recognize and their need that recognize their need for a savior. That's why we're here. I don't know if you've noticed this in your life. I've noticed this in my life that as the, the longer I walk with Jesus, the more I grow in my relationship with Christ, the more I recognize my own sinfulness. How often I fall short of the glory of God. Verse 27 says this. After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Now what's interesting here, that verb for he saw Levi was this idea of looking attentively at Levi. He was intently looking at Levi. In, most, in, in those days, most people had at least a couple names. Most people had two or three names. And so there was a Jewish name, there was a Roman name, and often a Greek name. Levi was his Jewish name. That's what we read about in Mark and Luke. He's referred to as Levi. But in the Gospel of Matthew... Uh, which is written by this Levi. Matthew is his Roman name. Hmm. So it could be the Gospel of Levi. Levi, as we understand this, Levi was a Jew who worked for and was protected by Rome. Okay? Levi, a Jew, but he worked for the Romans. And because he went from here to work for here, for this side, he was often seen as a traitor to his people. He was often seen as someone who was a sellout to the Roman Empire. And so these tax collectors had a, had a reputation for cheating people, okay, for overcharging in their taxes. And going over here and charging his own people with taxes far greater than what Rome was asking. And what he would do with the profits is he would put it in his own pocket. And so these tax collectors became very rich at the expense of their own people. Levi, the tax collector, would have been well known in his city. He would have been known as the guy that obviously we pay taxes to. In his tax collector booth, it was usually elevated. And so he could see down upon the crowd... And the crowd could see him, and anyone who was coming into that city would have to go and visit Levi and pay him taxes. And so certainly as Matthew would have been sitting in his tax collector booth above the crowd, he would have been able to see Jesus in action. He would have seen the crowds that were gathering around Jesus. He would have been able to hear some of the messages that Jesus was preaching and no doubt Levi would have been at times in that crowd that were gathering as Jesus was preaching on the, on, on the seaside. Or he would be up in his tax collector booth and he would be able to hear the others talking about Jesus and the message that they had just heard. And so certainly with Jesus walking around and gathering this great follower or great following of people, no doubt Levi was intrigued and interested in this man they called Jesus. He understood the message that Jesus was preaching about 
And when Jesus came to his tax collector booth and he said to Levi, Levi, follow me. I wonder if Jesus was looking into his heart and he says, Levi, you've got a lot of things. You've got a lot of money and you've got all that this world can offer you. But you're missing the one thing that your heart desperately desires and that is forgiveness for your sins. And I can imagine that Jesus, as he was sitting standing there and he was looking to Levi and he said, Levi, follow me. I wonder if in those words he was saying, Levi, you're just the guy that I want to come follow me, to be one of my disciples. You're just the guy that I'm looking for. Verse 28 tells us that Levi got up from his tax collector booth and he left everything and he followed Jesus. That word, follow Jesus, It means that he began following Jesus and he continued following Jesus. Levi doesn't waste any time responding to Jesus' message because this was not a request, this was a command. Not an invitation to Levi, but a call to discipleship. A a call to come and follow me. A call to walk the same road that I'm walking. A a, a call to be changed by Jesus. A call to be committed to leading others to follow Jesus as well. Now we need to understand because we might just kind of blow through this in our reading, but for Levi, he had everything that the world of his time could offer. He had it all. He had the tailored suits, the chauffeured chariots, he had the fine hotels and the big cigars. The diamonds, the paintings on the wall, a big house with a king-sized bed. And so when Jesus said, come follow me, there was lots for him to leave. He had been watching Jesus very carefully. He had heard the message of Jesus. And Jesus said, Levi, leave it, come follow me. And Levi did This was no small matter for Levi to leave everything. We know that some of the other disciples that followed Jesus, well, they left a fishing career, but you know what? If things didn't work out for them, they could always go back to that career. But Levi, leaving his tax collector booth, he could never go back to there. He's already been a traitor once already. So we read in verse 29, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. I mean, this gives us a little bit of an idea as to the type of wealth that Levi had. He had a party with a large crowd of people. Now, we understand and we assume that if you have a large gathering in your house, you probably have a large house to gather them in. And so not only was he inviting this large crowd to gather with him in his house, he was footing the bill. And Levi invites the only people that he knows, other tax collectors, and the scripture says, and others. You can read that in another translation that really says disreputable sinners. So what we understand that to be is Notorious, infamous, scandalous, disgraceful, not respectful guests. And he invited Jesus to be the guest of honor in this crowd in his house. I wonder about that crowd. I wonder if that crowd in their thoughts, they must have been thinking, you know, we will never get anywhere close to that Jesus guy. I mean, that Jesus guy is a religious man. He speaks for God. He preaches good news from God. He heals people. He would never heal us of our diseases. He would never be interested in me. But Levi says, you guys all come to my house because Jesus is coming. This was a crowd that Jesus could have never reached in the synagogue because this crowd was not invited to the synagogue. This crowd would have been removed from the synagogue. They would have been excommunicated from the synagogue because of their profession and because of their way of life. They wouldn't have been welcomed in there because if they would have come into that place, they would have defiled the whole place. And if they would have had any contact with any other people in that synagogue, they would have defiled those people. And so the people in that synagogue would have said, not a chance, you're not welcome here but they were welcomed in Levi's house. Hmm. 
You know, it's interesting to me how we often live up to the expectations that others put in our lives. This crowd had low expectations on them. And they lived up to, or maybe we should say they lived down to those expectations. Reminds me of a song by Garth Brooks. I won't sing it for you, because even though I share the same name, I do not share a singing voice with him. But I bet many of you know it. Because I've got friends in low places, where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases my blues away. And I'll be okay. Yeah, I'm not big on social graces. I think I'll slip on down to the oasis. Oh, I've got friends in low places. That's the type of crowd that was gathering here. I mean, imagine that scene in Levi's house. Here, Levi who was one of their own, was now converted and following Jesus. And he throws this massive party. And in his house are thieves and gangsters and hitmen and enforcers, drunks and prostitutes and all kinds of criminals, all kinds of outcasts that weren't welcome in the synagogue. Hey, listen, watch this. They're personally eating with the Son of God. I actually like the uh, English standard version of this because it reads like this. They were reclining at the table with them. They were taking their time eating together with the Son of God. The Son of God was taking his time eating with these notorious sinners. Now, I don't know about you in in your home, but I know in our house, man, if we scarf down the food and we take 10 minutes, that's a long time. We scarf that food down and then we're off to our next activity, but not here. Jesus was reclining with them at the table. Oh boy, to be a fly on that wall in that room. They sat together, they talked together as they ate their meal together. I wonder what that conversation around that table must have been like. I wonder what that would have been like. I'm sure that there were some off-color jokes there. I'm sure that there was some language and there were some things going on in that house that would have made a lot of us blush. And yet Jesus took his time to be there. He wasn't quick to run off to the next thing because Jesus loves them. And he had a message for them. And the message was the good news of the kingdom of God, that it was for them. They were welcomed in Levi's home. And they sat down and they conversed with Jesus and he with them. And they heard his message. I mean, I don't know about all of you here. But if you've ever wondered if God could love you, if you've ever wondered how far would the Lord go to come to me or to come to the people in my life, if you've ever wondered, could God save you? You don't have to go much further than this passage. This event in history is a pretty good clue for us, isn't it? You see, in this passage, we get the answer is that Jesus came for the very worst of the very worst of the very worst. Oh, boy. Heavenly Father, forgive me for the times when I've written people off and say they're too far gone. They're not too far gone in Jesus' mind. Jesus came for the down and out. He came for those that were marginalized. He came for those that were pushed out of our religious circles. He came for the ones that we label hopeless and helpless, who probably will never change. Jesus came for them. And I wonder if this is about the time when Jesus gave Levi a new name, the name Matthew. Some of you, if you have a child named Matthew, you might know what Matthew means. Matthew means the gift of God. Levi... Your name is 
gift of God. You're a gift of God. And so when Jesus called Levi, he accomplished three things. He saved a lost soul. He added a new disciple to his group. And he created an opportunity to explain his ministry to Levi's friends and also to the Pharisees and the scribes who were listening in. I mean, what an incredible act of love. What an, an extension of grace. But also, what a risk of reputation for Jesus. I mean, this act that he was doing, I mean, it was so mind-boggling. It was so unthinkable to the scribes and Pharisees that Jesus could ever save a tax collector. Okay? Never mind making that tax collector one of his disciples. And those who hated Jesus, the Pharisees and the scribes, they labeled Jesus by this event. And they said he's a glutton, he's a drunkard, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What they meant as a slam, what they meant as an insult, what they meant as a rebuke towards Jesus, Jesus wore as a badge of honor because not only was Jesus not separating himself from those distasteful characters, he was actually seeking them out. Amazing. Jesus wasn't just uh, accused of tolerating these wicked people. But he was charged with being a friend of theirs. Verse 30 says, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with these tax collectors and these sinners? You see, they were criticizing Jesus because they didn't understand neither his message nor his ministry. Jesus didn't fit their nice traditional religious box and they were rattled through it. But in order for Jesus to accomplish his mission, he had to go and be with those who needed a savior, with those who needed a physician, telling the Pharisees that this is exactly who he has come for. Verse 31 it says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And in this statement, Jesus gives three reasons why he's eating with them. Two of them are in this verse. One is found in Matthew, in Levi's recollection of this event. The first reason he gives for why he is eating with them is through an analogy. And he says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I mean, how obvious is that, right? I don't know of you who are healthy if you go see a doctor, probably not. We go see a doctor when we're sick. You and I don't argue with that. The Pharisees wouldn't even have argued with that. They would agree with Jesus on that point. These people were sick. We know that. The Pharisees know that. In fact, by their own admission, the Pharisees were saying, these are the sickest of the sickest of the sick. But here's what struck me this week as I was just pouring over this passage. If the Pharisees and the scribes could see how sick they were and how sinful these people were, why didn't they go to them and help them? Why couldn't they see that they needed a physician, the great physician, the divine doctor? I mean, Jesus' statement here by using an analogy was a strong charge against the Pharisees of their cold hearts. This is a strong charge against the Pharisees' wickedness. And actually, I don't think it's an overstatement to say a strong charge of their hatred for these people in the house. Jesus came for the sick. He's the divine doctor, the great physician, the divine physician. And so Jesus answers them by giving them an analogy. But then secondly, he answers them using scripture. 
In Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, this is Levi's recollection of this. Levi adds that Jesus said this, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. That's a quote from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. And it says in that passage that God doesn't want our external sacrifices. He wants the heart of mercy. See, that's the Beatitudes that we read about in Matthew as well. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. But the opposite, opposite of that is this, that those who are merciless will be judged without mercy. And so Jesus said to the Pharisees, go and learn what that means. Today, we might use the words this, you know what, go figure it out. That's what he was saying to the Pharisees. You see, Jesus is not interested in our outward behavior that is separated from a heart of repentance. He's not interested in our outward behavior at the expense of or the absence of our hunger for righteousness to following and pursuing him. And the third reason he gives is this. He answers from his personal authority. Verse 32, he says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I'm going to read again from the New Living Translation because I think it's so good. He says, I haven't come to call those who think that they are righteous, but those who know that they are uh, sinners and that they need to repent. That one would have stung. And the Pharisees picked up on that. Jesus associated with the wrong people, the sinners, the tax collectors, the undesirables, so that he could offer them God's love and God's forgiveness, regardless of their social status regardless of their profession, regardless of where they're at, Jesus came for them. Jesus says, that's why I have come. You see, this crowd in Levi's house, that was exactly the crowd, that was exactly the audience that Jesus came for. Jesus, our great physician, healed people of physical illnesses, yes. But he knew even greater than our physical illnesses was that he needed to come for those who recognize their spiritual sickness and who are in need of salvation. Jesus wasn't lowering his standards, but rather he was reaching out to souls who needed, who desperately needed him, who desperately need salvation. And in Matthew, or in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, we read these words, For the Son of Man, that is Jesus, came, not to, came to seek and to save those who are lost. The Pharisees were really quick to diagnose everybody else's problems, but they were blinded to their own needs. That they were sinners just like everybody else, and even though they appeared righteous on the outside, inside they were corrupt. And here's what we get in all of this. That we cannot enter the kingdom of God without recognition of our own sinfulness. That God is offering his grace, God is offering his mercy, God is offering us forgiveness, and he offers his compassion. And he will forgive us all of our sins if we confess, if we come to him and we confess our sins to him. But he can't do anything for those who think they're okay. He can't do anything for those who think that they are righteous in and of themselves. He can't do anything for those who think that they're good in and of themselves, but rather he came to call sinners to repentance. And so church, it's not made up of a bunch of righteous people in and of our own, but the church is made up of repentant sinners. It's made of people who recognize that it is God's righteousness that is our cover. And so this morning, this week, as I've been wrestling with this passage, I have some questions. I wonder 
if people would call us a friend of sinners. I wonder if SEMC would be known as a friend of sinners. Are we more like Jesus, who befriends those outside, those who are down and out, those who are marginalized, those whom maybe others have written off? Or are we more like the Pharisees who stay far away from those tax collectors and those sinners in our lives for fear that we may get tarnished, that our squeaky clean reputation might be at stake here? And I wonder if we should not be more careful about whose reputation we are trying to protect. Jesus loved being known as a friend of sinners. And today I am thankful that he is. Because if he was not a friend of sinners, then I would not be considered a friend of God's. Scripture tells us that he humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself by taking on the form of a human and died a criminal's death as a substitute for you, and for me, to save us from our sins. And I wonder if my friends, people in my life can see Jesus in me, if Jesus can see Jesus, if people can see Jesus in us. Not because we partake in their sin, but because we love them and we embrace them despite their sin in their lives. Because even though Jesus hung around with sinners in his day, he never fell into their sins. And so as we bring Jesus into our world, into, as we bring Jesus into our life, we need to be on our guard that we do not adopt or get drawn into the sins of this world, but that we would be wise, that we would stay closely connected to Jesus Christ, that we would depend on him for wisdom and for discernment as we reach out to a lost and dying world. And I wonder sometimes if perhaps we as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, have become so isolated from those that we are actually called to go and reach out to. One of the unfortunate things I think, I want to be careful about this, one of the unfortunate things I, I guess about being a Christian for a long time is that our connections with this group of people dwindles over time. I mean, think about your friendship circles. Do you have any friends over here that you call friends? Or are your friends just here? We get so involved in, in, in the church and we get so involved in, in so many church things and, and that is good. That's important for our spiritual growth. But the longer we walk with Jesus, there's a tendency to become more isolated and withdrawn from those that we are called to reach out to. And so I would challenge us, I would encourage us to pray about that this week and in the days to come to ask God to move us into the lives of one or two people who really need to experience his mercy and his grace. And then the other thing, I'm going to say one more thing about this. I wonder if sometimes in my own life, sometimes in our lives that we just spend a lot of time talking about fishing for people but never actually do it and we've wasted our time. I wonder sometimes if we've just spent a lot of time downloading the latest, greatest message, and we've just spent a lot of time gathering all this information about Jesus, but we've never talked about him with people in our community. I wonder if we've just spent so much time downloading all of this, but we have never shared our story. We've never shared what difference Christ has made in our lives. I wonder sometimes if we've just become spiritually fat Christians and we've just sat at the table and we've soaked it all up but we've never worked it off. I wonder. I wonder. And so this is a challenge that I'm speaking to myself, a challenge that I'm speaking to us as a church 
not just to know the facts about Jesus, but to see God's power in action as we step out in faith and we share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. I wonder if we would invite our life groups to join with us in praying for our friends to be open to meeting with Jesus. I wonder if there would be some life groups here that would maybe throw a Matthew party and invite their friends to gather together. I mean, wow, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be exciting? Wouldn't that be messy? Yeah. Some of us need to invite some mess into our lives. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. So I encourage us to throw out our nets and experience the adventure and joy of inviting people into a relationship with Jesus.